thanks for watching. Today I'll be introducing the multifamily module into my all-in-one model. And I'll be doing that by walking you through just a basic uh, apartment acquisition investment deal. So let's get started. The first thing you want to do is download the latest version of the model. You can find that by coming, come, by coming to adventuresincre.com, up here in real estate modeling, Excel models. Just click the acre all-in-one model. Uh, right here, you'll see the most recent version. Um, click the download the model, come down, just go ahead and download it. I have that available here, so I'll just open it up. Let's move it to the side here. And let's get started. On the post attached to this video, you'll find the assumptions. If you want to walk through and do this with me, it's in a PDF. You can download those or find the assumptions uh, in the body of the post itself. So with the model open, we're first going to want to go to the summary tab. You'll notice there's only two tabs open right now. The, the balance of those tabs that you need uh, for underwriting this particular deal will become available to you as you make uh, selections. You'll see that now. So first, let's change this investment name. This uh, will be modeling Saddle Ranch Estates. It's a hypothetical multifamily deal. Uh, no such property exists in the real world. I'm just going to keep all the rest of these assumptions the same just because they don't really matter that much. Other than parking spaces, I'm going to change that to 319 spaces. This was built in 2005. I'm going to delete this picture. Leave that blank for now. The next thing I'm going to want to do is is uh, set the modules that I need for this underwriting. So you have here ORI module and that's for office, retail, or industrial. Since this is a multifamily deal, I'll turn that off. And what you'll see is the multifamily module then will then automatically turn on. Now, the, the current version of this model, you can't have both office, retail, and industrial and multifamily, both of those modules on at the same time. In a future version of the model, I will uh, make those compatible together. Next, uh, there will be permanent financing, so I'll select that to yes. Uh, the development module is not on because this value is set to zero and that's what we want because uh, there is no development component here. Then the multifamily tabs, I'm going to want to set to show. I want to set the report tabs to show but leave the calculation tabs hidden. Next in my assumptions, I'm going to assume it's a 10 year analysis period with an analysis start January 1st, 2018. Again, no development length. I'll continue down here under my valuation assumptions. I'm going to be using a 475 uh, market NOI cap rate. And so my uh, matrix cap rate is 5%, and you can watch a video on how that's set up. Uh, again, that is based on your uh, organization and what you uh, deem to be uh, the your matrix uh, cap rate and, and discount rates. Here though, I'm just going to make this 475. And then uh, my target unlevered IRR is a 7%. And so that means we're going to want to set our discount rate to be equal to 7%. And the reason why there's such a delta between the market cap rate and the discount rate is we're, we're taking some risk because there's a small value add component here, uh, plus we're assuming quite a bit of growth. And you'll see that as we get into it. <clears throat> Lastly, uh, the growth in our market cap rate, uh, there is growth. We're going to assume it, it grows by five basis points per year through the end of the term, which would give us an exit cap rate of 5.25 percent, right? 475 plus 50 basis points. I'm going to leave my purchase price and my acquisition uh, costs a blank for now because the whole purpose for this exercise, uh, if I'm underwriting this deal right, is to arrive at some purchase price, some offer that I can make to the seller. In commercial real estate, generally there isn't an asking price like there is, say, in residential. And, and so there's kind of a bidding process and you as one of the bidders have to put forward your price and that's what this exercise is all about. So uh, I'll leave now the summary tab. Let's move to the permanent debt. Now my permanent debt assumptions, I'm gonna sue 65% of my acquisition costs is the loan amount. So I just come to this cell and I make this equal 
here's my acquisition cost and this is dynamic right so um, in the future as we're uh, manipulating our model if I were to change anything or if I were to change the acquisition price here our loan amount will automatically adjust such that it is always equal to 65 percent of our acquisition cost uh, next loan fees of half a percent so I'm just gonna make this equal that times 0 0.005 half a percent uh, interest rate of four and a quarter 360 year am with no IO uh, the term is automatically set to be equal to the length of our analysis period or in this case it's 120 months assuming no junior debt and we're done with our uh, permanent debt. Next, we move to equity cash flow. This is our partnership assumptions. Uh, we're assuming uh, we, are, we are the sponsor in this case. We're coming up with 5% of the equity. Uh, we're gonna go out and raise the balance of the equity from LP investors. Uh, and then in terms of the promote structure, um, we're gonna have a 6% pref. And then the first hurdle above that, 10%, the next hurdle 15 percent and, and on uh, the hurdle or the the pref is split uh, peri passu based on equity contribution and then thereafter from 6 to a 10 it's 20 80 10 to a 15 30 70 and then above 15 it's 40 60. lastly we're, we're going to want to look at our property cash flow tab and i noticed really the only two inputs here are uh, how we how we're deriving value, either uh, capping NOI or capping cash flow from operation. I'm keeping it as NOI. And then what percent on, on our reversion at the end, what are the set, what's the selling cost percentage? That's set to 2%, so I'll leave that at two. Next, let's move into the operation section. So on in the model itself, that's this blue section down below. We can change the multifamily settings if we want to change any of the nomenclature I'm not going to in this case so I'll just move to my rent roll so it's called a rent roll but really it's a unit mix we're not detailing by unit we're detailing by unit type so in this case there are six unit types now you'll notice up here in cell F6 we can set the number of unit types up to 25 and when we do that, it will gray out the rows that are unnecessary. Now, the default model comes with 12 pre-filled rows. And you'll notice that when we change it from 12 to 6, those, these rows gray out, but the inputs are still there. Those inputs, however, are not figured into the calculation, but if you want to clean this up, just for presentation purposes, you can delete all of the blue cells. Okay, don't delete any of the black cells. Uh, not that it'll really affect your uh, calculation. However, if down the road you do want to add to this particular investment uh, an additional uh, unit, if you've deleted one of those black cells, then uh, it could mess up your calculation. So let's then move on if, over here in our assumptions. I have a unit mix table. Well, let's bring this over so we can see it a little bit better. So again, six units. Uh, if we change the unit types, we have unit type A, B, C, D, E, and F. And what I'm going to do is I'll fill out the first unit type and then uh, pause the video and go fill the rest. You don't have to watch me do that. But So I'm just going to fill out here uh, details from our assumptions. Uh, unit type A is a studio with zero bedrooms, one bathroom. Uh, average square footage of these unit type is 677. There are 41 of these. Uh, now, what I recommend for acquisition, regardless of where you are at in terms of leasing, so whether you're 100% uh, leased or you have some unleased units, because this is a, uh, a stabilized building, I recommend that you set all of the units to leased. Okay, and, and the result of that is that your vacant units will be underwritten at your in-place rent rather than if you um, set a certain number of vacant units, those vacant units will be underwritten at market rent. And in this case here, I'm, I am going to be rolling my in-place rents to a market rent uh, after, upon the first roll 
And so I want my vacant units also to start in place and then roll to market. And as such, I'm going to set all of these values to be equal to my total units such that uh, there are no vacant units. Again, on the, in the unit mix. And we can account for vacancy on the operating statement, which I'll show you in a bit. Next, it asks for lease up pay. So this is more for either a value add or a development deal where you're going to be modeling a lease up. Uh, next, we have what is the average in place rent for this unit type? Well, here it's $925 per unit. And I will roll that to market. Now, there are other options here. I cannot roll it to market, which will leave my in place rent amount the same through the entire term. Uh, or I can roll it to market in a specific month. So let's say I have a value add play over a three year period. What I can do then is I can set, say, month 37. Oops, month 37. And then the rent will, uh, these will be underwritten at the in place rent through to month 37, at which time uh, this particular unit type will roll to market. Now I'm not going to use that. I'm just going to set this to yes. And as a result, this will simply roll one year from now to market. And market rent today is $940. Then in terms of market rent growth, I'm just going to have all of these as an increase percent annual. And they increase at 5% five in year, year one, 4% year two, and then 3% every year thereafter. Next, uh, our RUBS assumption or our utility reimbursement assumption is $45 per unit per month. So I'm just going to set that to 45. Our make ready cost, so, so that's the next thing. Uh, make ready, uh, this is the cost to think of as on office retail or industrial side, kind of your TIs, right? It's the cost um, that, that you have to spend to get the unit ready to lease to the new tenant. And sometimes there's that, you incur that cost even if the tenant renews uh, because there's just some miscellaneous um, renovations, perhaps painting, carpet, uh, just some touch-up things that need to be done in order to prepare the unit to release. And so in this case, I have $500 per unit on a, a new unit and $250 on a renew. I'm assuming that there are there's no concessions or no free rent offered either on a new lease or on a renewal lease. And so free rent on second generation leases. Uh, what this column is asking is sometimes you have right free rent during a, uh, a lease up period, maybe a new development. And then those, those concessions burn off after the first generation of leases. And in all subsequent generation leases, there, are no, there is no concession offered. In this case, because there are no concessions period, this column is unnecessary, so I'll just leave that at no, but it really doesn't matter if I set it to yes, nothing would happen either. Next, my renewal probability is 40%, and then there are 15 days of downtime between tenants. And the result of this is, this is going to take a blend, so in downtime, because there's a 40% renewal probability, 40% of the time, downtime will be zero, zero days. 60% uh, of the time, downtime will be 15 days. And that will then go to the downtime line on our operating statement, which I'll show you right here. It shows up in the downtime line here as a vacancy. Uh, that even if you are 100% leased, you will have that downtime between tenants, and that is generally lost income. So then I, now that I've filled out one tenant, I'm going to pause the video and fill out the rest. Okay, and with our unit mix, our rent roll a tab completed, I'm going to move now to the multifamily operating statement. Now here we have uh, our operating assumptions. We also have operating history. Because this property was built 10 plus years ago, uh, there's some history that we can look at and that will help us determine the appropriate assumptions for uh, our stabilized year one uh, operating statement here. So first we have gross potential rent uh, for 2000, uh, 
2015, 16, and 17. Again, our analysis begins July or January 1st, 2018. So we have actual numbers through there. So, oops. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to fill out this entire section using these values. Uh, I'm going to pause the video to do that so you don't have to watch me. Okay, so I've dropped in my operating history and I can see a trend here, increasing trend in income as well as an increasing trend, uh, less so, but somewhat in operating expenses. And then the, operate, and then the net operating income ticking up. Now, uh, what I may consider as I'm underwriting this is there's this big jump from 2016 to 2017 and I want to ask myself how durable is that as I'm coming up with a stabilized long-term uh, net operating income that I'm then capping and using to help me come up with a value. Uh, I, wanna, I want to think through whether this here is just a seller preparing the property or uh, uh, managing the property such in the last year to maximize net operating income um, in such a way that's not sustainable long term. Or is this just a, a change in the market? The market maybe had a big bump uh, recently and, and this, this net operating income is long term. So in doing that, I'm just gonna start filling out my stabilized pro forma and that will determine my operating uh, forecast. Um, and it will determine my value and, and other things as well. So let's move down here, operating assumptions. So other income assumptions, uh, we already dropped in our rubs on the unit mix table. Uh, parking income, there is none here. We're assuming this is just a garden apartment uh, with no parking income. Storage income, our assumption is, so there's 110 storage units and the going rate for the storage units is $45 per unit per month, so times 12, but we're assuming there's a 90% vacancy, okay, before taking this general vacancy line. So I'm just gonna do that. And then other income, I'm just going to set at 2.5% of my total rental revenue, okay, and that's roughly 82%. Then I look at my history, and that's about in line, right? So there's, so there's some some growth here, and I can, I guess, reasonably assume that this year, year 2018, there will be some growth above 2017 if the trend continues. Uh, same with my other income, uh, pretty pretty strong growth here, so I'll just keep that. And then going forward, I'm just going to keep a 2% growth rate. You'll recall that there was a different growth rate for our rent. Uh, I believe it was five, four, three, and three till the end. And that results in a 3.3% compounded average growth rate through our full 10 year hold. But for income, just 2%. Next, I'm going to use a 3.5% general vacancy. Now, why so low, you might ask? Well, uh, we have already an embedded downtime vacancy. That's a result of those 15 days of downtime between tenants. And as such, our blended vacancy, you'll see, uh, is roughly six, five, six percent. And that feels right. If I, if I look at, let me pull this out to the right so I can see the full tenure. I can, if I look at my entire 10 years, I'm averaging about 95% occupancy on economic occupancy. And you can ignore somewhat the physical occupancy because we are assuming that all of our units are always full, but then we're taking uh, vacancy in two different lines. And as a result, we're getting about a 95% eco economic occupancy or 5% vacancy. That makes, I think that makes sense. I can also look at uh, my utility reimbursement. Well, based on my current utility um, uh, assumption, which I'm changing that, so I can ignore this line for now, but you can look at this line and see what percentage of your utilities is being recovered through this uh, rubs line. Next, I'm going to move into my operating expense assumptions, and I'm just going to take 2017 actuals and grow those by 2%. So I'm just gonna take that times 1.02, and I'm gonna do a control C. I'm going to highlight all of the blue cells. I don't wanna change 
uh, my make ready so I'm just gonna highlight the blue and then I'm going to hit alt H VF and the reason I do the alt H VF rather than just control V is I only want to paste the formula itself I don't want to paste the anything else which might be formatting and, uh, and otherwise and that just keeps the look of my spreadsheet clean. If I were to copy down formatting, I, I would lose, in this case, the underlining. I could potentially be copying down borders or other things or maybe other uh, different uh, colored fonts that I don't want to. So I use the Control C copy and then the Alt H V F to just copy down the formula. So now we have uh, these assumptions are simply our 2017 grown by 2%. I'm going to set all of my costs to be fixed. This doesn't matter because our vacancy or our occupancy is assumed to be 100%. And then I look here, what else? Uh, I want my management fee to be 3% of EGI. So I go management fee equals effective gross income time 0.03. And then I want the growth rate on all of these to be 2% except for my management fee. I want my management fee to be e growth rate to be equal to my effective gross income. Now why? Well, the reason why is I want this line to always be roughly 3% of this value. And so in order to do that, I set this to 3% and then I set this growth rate to be equal to EGI growth rate. Finally, this orange cell, what do we do here? Well, an orange cell on this uh, sheet is an optional input. What that means is there is a formula, and you'll see another one here and another one here. These are formulas that are defaulted to something that in most cases makes sense, but not always. Uh, that's especially true of this formula where it is estimating your first stabilized year, but that may or may not be true. Now, it's important though that if you do change this, it flows through to your valuation up front, and you could be overly optimistic by setting a future year as your stabilized year, and thus capping uh, a net operating income that's grown some that may not be market, okay? So, uh, Coming back to my make ready, I just ask myself, does this value make sense from a long-term uh, standpoint? And I think so. So it is is equal to my year one or my stabilized year. And I don't expect that to change other than some standard growth rate going into the future. So I'll leave that at 99 too. Then finally, we move into CapEx. Now this is where I'm going to do something uh, a little outside the box. So if I look at my CapEx assumptions, I have uh, two items here. Uh, this other CapEx uh, capital improvement plan where eight, we're gonna spend $800,000 in year one and $800,000 in year two just to get this property up to snuff. Uh, get it to a point where the market rent makes sense. There's also just a capital reserve of $250 per unit per year that we'll be including. So let's first do this capital reserve. We're just gonna take 250. We're gonna multiply that by multifamily units, which are 248. Uh, but this is a named cell MF underscore units. That's 62,000. But how do we do this $800,000 per year for the first two years? Well, the beauty of using Excel is this isn't a black box. If you understand the model, you can make changes to the black cell so long as you understand the impact of that. And how this operating statement works is all of these values are summing monthly values down below, okay? And so you don't wanna make any changes necessarily to these black cells because then that wouldn't be reflected in your monthly statement. So my recommendation, we're gonna come down here to this line, this other CapEx on a monthly basis line. And I'm just going to look at the first two years. So let me highlight that. Comes out to about, what's that, right there, okay. And I'm just gonna highlight that yellow. And the reason I highlighted it yellow is that tells me down the road, hey, I changed the default formula for this to something different. 
Okay, and what is that something different? Well, over this two-year period, there's 1.6, so I'm just going to do equals, 1.6 million dollars worth of expenses divided by 24 months. And so I'm just going to straight line uh, that 1.6 million. So I'll hit uh, 1.6 million divided by 24, control, enter. And when I do control enter, that makes that formula go across all of my selected cells. And you'll see the result is I just dropped in a custom formula uh, equal to $66,667 each month through those first two years. Okay, And if we come up to the annual then, come back, you're going to see it. $800,000 in year one, $800,000 in year two. However, in my stabilized pro forma, it doesn't make sense. I'm not. I don't want to cap these one-time operating exp uh, capital expenditures into perpetuity. I do want to cap my reserves, uh, but I don't necessarily want to cap. By the way, I'm capping NOI, so it's not necessarily important here. But uh, some firms will cap cash flow from operations, and so it's important that this value is correct. And in this case, I'm just going to leave it at zero. Finally, I want to come out and I want to look at my residual pro forma. So I have my stabilized pro forma, but so my stabilized pro forma is determining value at the onset. This residual pro forma uh, determines the purchase price that a future seller will pay for this property or the amount of money they'll give us to exit. And I just want to be sure that I'm comfortable with these values. Now, the very first thing I see is there, this is a pretty strong growth. And that seems a little unrealistic. So I'm just going to set that equal to my year 10. I'll grow this. I think that's fair. I'm going to make the reimbursement equal to year 10. And this is, this is somewhat being more conservative. Uh, you're paring back your residual value sum, uh, or at least in this case, that's what I'm doing. But I'm going to keep my growth in expense is the same, such that my residual year is actually a little under my year 10. And the only real reason I'm doing that is I look at my going in, my stabilized pro forma, and I, you know, that residual pro forma just felt a little out of whack. This though, again, this is all on you as uh, the analyst to make the determination what is appropriate. So with the operating statement complete, I can go back to my summary tab. And here we're going to see two values. The first value takes that year one stabilized pro forma, caps it at the market cap rate 4.75%, and get, comes out with a value, $41 million. So what is that telling us? Well, maybe the market values this asset at about $41.2 million. The other option in terms of valuation is we can take the net cash flow on this property from time zero, zero through to reversion and discount that back to or by 7% to today. And the present value of all of those future cash flows is 41.457 million. Now, something that's interesting, you'll notice our unlevered IRR, 7% is equal to our discount rate. And that's because where there's no development cash flows or where all of your outflows uh, come in uh, or your investment cash flows come in time zero, when you set your discount rate or whatever you set your discount rate, your annual unlevered IRR will be equal to that. And so that's why you'll notice when we put under our valuation that we wanted to target a 7% unlevered IRR. All we had to do was set our discount rate to 7%. And the result was our unlevered IRR was equal to that same percentage point. So then the question comes out, what do we offer? Okay, well, if we believe our assumptions, uh, if we believe our forecast, we can pay $41.457 million, um, uh, or we can spend $41.457 million, or with $50,000 worth of due diligence and closing costs, uh, we can we would need to offer forty one point four million dollars to get a seven percent unlevered IRR. The result of that would be a ten percent levered IRR 
on a property level, or if we're looking on a partnership level, we as the sponsor would yield about a 19% levered IRR. Our equity would grow 5.35 times. We would need to come up with $775,000. Uh, our distribution would be $4 million, and so our net increase in our uh, cash, $3.3 million. So that's the multifamily module. Uh, again, we're in beta here. I'm finding errors uh, each time I go through this. Uh, they're getting smaller and smaller, but nonetheless, there are likely more, uh, and, and that's where we need your help. I mess around with this. Let me know what you can find. Uh, I'll continue to release updates as I find those and as we work through our features list. And uh, thanks for watching.